Okay, uh, thank you, Dave, uh, and great sessions. Uh, my name is E. Saxon uh, Um I'm a BSc in uh, Geographical Information Science and Earth Observation, and uh, currently working with, uh, with the Zimbabwe National Geospatial and Space Agency. Um, yeah. Um, then, um, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Um, and I'll be moderating the next four sessions. And uh, this session um, uh, is based on uh, satellite-based Earth observation and uh, numerical modeling for improved detection, uh, assessment, and focus on uh, of uh, natural hazards. Uh, in this talk, um, uh, we, we are joined by uh, Dr. Uh, Sheila Kulen, an active member of uh, the GEO program, and uh, she will discuss how open source data can uh, help uh, determine rainfall triggered shallow landslides uh, risk at uh, large scales. Uh, she will also expand uh, more on her bio, but briefly, she is a physical scientist and uh, assistant professor at uh, the University of uh, uh, at the City University of New York. Uh, and at GEO, she serves as deputy chair of the group on Earth Observations, uh, Disaster Risk Reduction, uh, Working Group 3. Um, I'm just going to share uh, a pre-recorded video. Then we're going to be joined by her. Okay. It's coming out. Good day, everyone. My name is Sheila Avalon Collin. I am a physical scientist and an assistant professor of earth sciences at the City University of New York. I also serve as deputy chair of the disaster risk reduction team of the International Group on Earth Observations, which is dedicated to investigating links between climate change, the sustainable development goals, and disaster risk reduction. I would like to start today by asking you to think for a moment whether you think uh, if there is an increase on the frequency at which disasters are happening lately in the world. Just uh, think about that for, for a moment. Well, let's see if uh, your thinking was in the right track. According to this data that you see here in the screen from the emergency management database, they are actually on the rise. This graph, although, is tricky because it does not tell you that reporting has also been improving since the 1980s. And it's not like a like, volcanoes started exploding more often or earthquakes started happening more frequently. But if we are to break down this information by category of disaster, then we can definitely conclude that at least two thirds of these increase is not due to reporting, but it is real. And it's a result of the so-called uh, hydrometeorological disasters, such as droughts, hurricanes, floods, and other extreme weather events. The good news is that when it comes to deaths, right, as a result of these disasters, we see an opposite distribution with less deaths in the present as there were before, but also this graph, what this graph doesn't tell you is that in reality, if you did not die in a disaster, it is most likely that you will end up needing help. And that brings us to how costly natural disasters have become. Disasters are more expensive now than they were ever before. 
And that is because more people live in urban areas and sometimes they move to areas where they are more likely to experience a natural hazard. But uh, wait, I am saying natural hazards and then I'm saying natural disasters. So what's the difference then? What really is a natural disaster? Well, it is actually very important to define what a natural disaster is, or perhaps emphasize the difference between a natural hazard and a natural disaster. So you see, we live in, um, in a planet that is active. We have naturally occurring events, such as landslides, droughts, earthquakes, volcanic explosions, wildfires, and all of these are natural. They happen regardless whether human beings are present on the planet or not. But when we add the human factor to the equation, natural hazards can become natural disasters. Actually, in order to make it to the category of natural disaster in the previous statistics I showed you from the Global Emergency Management Database, a natural hazard needs to have killed 10 or more people or have injured, displaced, or evacuated 100 people or more in order to be categorized as a natural disaster. So, Obviously, the idea then, uh, very simply put, is to come up with solutions that can help us prevent or diminish the effects of these naturally um, occurring uh, events and the, and the impact that they have on human beings. There are actually various disciplines dedicated to this effort at different levels, at the before, during, and after a disaster. But before the events happen, uh, they are mostly focused on either prediction, forecasting, or early warning. And so today, I'm going to talk to you about how people like me are taking advantage of big data, open big data, uh, usually provided by satellite observations and artificial intelligence, which is based on machine learning in order to have better predictions and early warnings. <clears throat> so let's talk about Let's talk about remote uh, sensors for a little bit. Remote sensors collect data from uh, detect, detect, uh, by detecting energy that is reflected from the Earth. These sensors can be mounted on satellites or mounted on aircraft. Satellites often offer, often offer accurate, frequent, and almost instantaneous uh, collection of data over large areas anywhere in the world. So this plethora of information can only be analyzed um, and made sense uh, with computers. And one of the most popular methods because of its great adaptability to many different variables and scenarios is artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a relatively old field, but there are many new possibilities and applications like not only yourself driving cars today or what song or video is going to play next in YouTube, but artificial intelligence in the form of machine learning can help us teach the computer about the conditions of past events. And in turn, we have a tool that can help us have better predictions and early warnings. Now, artificial intelligence is a fascinating field that can also be applied to earth sciences. But what is important to highlight here is that we 
most have a solid understanding on how the processes, the real processes on the earth work. We must have a solid understanding about the phenomena and the physics behind the phenomena. Otherwise, based on my experience, and probably you have heard this before, you have garbage in, you will wind up having garbage out, right? So here I'm going to give you a couple, um, a particular example on how we can integrate all these tools in understanding when part one particular phenomena in our case is going to be a uh, rainfall trigger landslide. Now, I say uh, rainfall trigger landslides. You see, it's very important, for example, when we talk about understanding the physical phenomenon of how these things happen, it is very important to understand the difference between rainfall trigger landslides, a mudslide, a rock slide, and other, any type of downslope uh, slide. Um, this particular type of landslide are caused because of changes in the shear strength of the soil. They are considered to be shallow because they do not go deeper than three meters. And uh, they are codependent in the interaction of hydrological and mechanical processes. Now, when we attempt to study these phenomena in large scales using satellite observations. We are forced to obtain information that is not precise 100%. For example, where and when did the event actually happen? And also, at these large scales, what parameters are the best for that particular locality to better understand how it could happen in that particular place. Now, in addition of these challenges, we also have um, the, the, the fact that we have to deal with two very different sets of parameters in time and, and space. Those that do not change or mostly do not change and those that are constantly changing. The challenge is to find a way to integrate them so they can work in unison. And in this graph right here, we have a roadmap on how that could look like. We devise a plan, we identify the factors, either static or dynamic, and we incorporate them in an algorithm. First, we have to start with a list of the event from where the machine is going to learn from, which is a landslide inventory. The inventory itself contains information about how uncertain the locality or where these events happen. Then we, of course, need representations of the topography, the soil type, the land cover, and many other characteristics of that locality. Then we have to move on to determine what satellite products uh, can help us with dynamic variables such as rain or antecedent moisture moisture and so the selecting of the variables requires a lot of understanding on how the phenomena works and far and furthermore the understanding of each of the products that we are going to use to prepare our analysis but uh, that's not all. <laughs> we know that this information will present some challenges, particularly because it's what we call uh, non-structured data. So we have to devise a way which usually results on or boils down to creating more algorithms uh, that can help us reduce uncertainty. In this particular case, we are performing a threshold sensitivity analysis for every static variable at different distances of the event uh, that is listed on the landslide inventory. We had to 
because otherwise the analysis could have been significantly inaccurate. For the case of this example, on top here, you can see three different events and the circles are the buffer analysis. The buffer analysis, uh, it's taken at different distances from the point where it's to have said that the landslide had happened. Uh, each variable that we determine to be appropriate uh, is extracted for each specific area. Now, here we can see how the process works. For this event, I am showing you just one variable, which is slope. And the threshold analysis takes all of the pixel values on each one of these buffers and statistically calculates the 50th, the 75th, the 95th, and the 99th percentiles. Here, I'm only showing the 99th percentile. And for all landslide events and for all of the variables for this particular study, we ended up with about 12,000 different buffers. So once we have mathematically reduced the uncertainties, we can start the actual process of modeling. We tell the system about where the events happen, under what conditions, and with an algorithm, the system projects the probability of those areas where a landslide is likely to happen. But mind you, I said where, not when, right? So for that, we need to integrate dynamic and static factors together. And well, thank God that can be done by the computer because actually doing it manually could be very, very hard. So after all that's done and said, our parameters are now integrated. We can finally move on to determine whether a rainfall event will trigger a landslide or not. The algorithm, when the algorithm finds a rainfall value that triggers the equation to be equal to one, in our case, one represents uh, an event, a landslide event happening. That value is stored as an index, an index that will uh, represent a landslide event as a function of the dynamic and static factors. So this whole story, the goal is so that a system, this system can be applied by decision makers as it estimates the amount of water volume for a given duration required to trigger a shallow landslide in the indicated pixel area. Now, I haven't mentioned yet that there are some challenges when it comes to information retrieved from satellites um, in certain areas of the world. Mind you, satellite information is restricted sometimes by either resolution and by field of view or depth of view. In this particular example here in the screen, um, tropical areas are some of those locations where uh, satellites have some kind of difficulty reading certain parameters. In that case, we also have the op option of using a combination of, of, of uh, gauges and satellite observations. In this case, uh, CHIRPS. CHIRPS is also open data available in Google's Earth engine, and it ranges from 1981 all the way to today. We also have Copernicus, which is a new data set of uh, land cover for all over the world, which is also open data and available to all. Uh, and we're currently working on develop, developing susceptibility analysis that incorporates the methods that I previously mentioned with these other types of information. So where does this all this leads us? Well, um, using all of this open data 
and taking advantage of new technologies, we can definitely develop useful models for the entire planet. What we have created for certain localities, it is possible to be replicated in other areas of the world. Now, the ultimate goal, of course, is to uh, partner up with entities such as uh, the Group of Earth Observations or the United Nations uh, this Risk Reduction entities with the capacity of influencing change in the way of how they can reach decision makers and propose solutions based on our findings. In such a way, we can break that gap there is between scientific analysis and research and the application to real uh, life scenarios. So with that said, I would like to thank you very much for your undivided attention and please let me know if there are any questions okay welcome uh, dr kulin hello um, hello everybody uh, thank you for that great presentation and um and i'll open the floor to questions but before that maybe you have a one word or two uh, following your presentation Hello, Dr. Kulian. Yes, I'm fine. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, I was saying a um, uh, very great presentation. And um, before we dive into questions, um, maybe you have one word or two uh, following that presentation. Thank you. Uh, hey, I'm sorry, a what? I couldn't hear. I'm saying um, maybe we have one word or two uh, following that presentation before we dive into questions. Um, no, I, 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 I can't understand, I can't hear properly, I'm sorry. Well, maybe it's a bad connection. I'm trying to fix the volume, it's not working. Oh, your volume. Uh, maybe you can type it in the chat. Okay. Um. Hi, Chill. I, I think uh, I think I was able to hear Isaacson. That if you can hear me, okay. If you if you wanted to add a word or two, or just any brief comments, um, you know, following the, your your video recording of your presentation. Oh, oh, okay. Yes, I uh, yeah, I was having problems with the connection and and the computer in general. So um, I'm glad that you were able to uh, stream the pre-recorded presentation. Um, uh, the presentation I prepared was a little bit more general uh, in, in less technical, but I think it encompassed um, the general strategies and uh, importance of understanding natural hazards and then these hazards becoming natural disasters. There are many ways in which open data can uh, help us uh, with uh, understanding these phenomena and preparing models that have the capability or um, informing uh, decision makers uh, with uh, what solutions or preparedness they can uh, further for the benefit of everyone in the planet. So yeah, I am um, glad to take any questions or I'll just leave my email uh, in the chat in case you want to contact me. Okay, uh, thank you for those words. Um, uh, to those joining us uh, live, uh, do you have any questions? Please uh, leave them in the chat box. And also, um, 
you can also email them to to Dr. Sheila. Yeah. Okay. I'm just checking on the questions. Okay, at this moment, maybe maybe they will email you the questions. Um, but I'm just curious in terms of uh, 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 what you said in terms of uh, uh, one of the future directions being um, all this information reaching decision makers. I think that's where the impact is, right? Right, and uh, that's why um, I am a firm believer that uh, not leaving uh, scientific research just in a published uh, journal is one of the uh, main goals that a scientist uh, should have working in applied sciences. Um, in my case, I have teamed up with uh, GEO, and I have teamed teamed up with uh, the New York New York State where I am uh, and uh, trying to co make that connection with decision makers in the in my in my state uh, to study the effects of climate change in the state and see what uh, how my research can uh, help those people uh, come up to an informed decision about the direction in which they're going to lead the state. In the case of GEO, GEO is very proactive in engaging um, policymakers. Uh, I know they're working in, in ways to inform them. And the same with the United Nations uh, disaster reduction information, which is directed to towards these people, the specifically decision makers. Oh, okay, uh, fantastic. Um, I think uh, uh, we might end in, we might eat maybe some some of the end of your time into the next session. <laughs> like like I said but, to my students. But, uh, but thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. So thank okay. you so much uh, for the presentation yeah. again. Yeah. All right. Thank you so okay. much for having me. Goodbye. Okay. Goodbye. Um, okay. Uh...